I'm Soham Das, and you are watching the Exploring Central Asia talk series presented by the Timothy Foundation. Over the years, the Central Asian region has been a crucial focus for us at the Timothy Foundation. Uh, the Central Asia talk series is in a line of our several major academic and practical diplomatic initiatives related to the region with the participation of leading diplomats, experts, organizations, and institutions. In this talk series, we have had some of the leading experts on Central Asia from across the world talk about diverse aspects of this vibrant and fascinating region. Today, at the sixth talk of the Exploring Central Asia talk series, our distinguished speaker is renowned expert, Professor Alexander Puri. Professor Alexander Puri is a player of Professor of Political Science at Barnard College, Columbia University. From 2015 to 2021, he served as the 15th director of Columbia University's Hadman Institute for the Study of Russia, Eurasia, and Eastern Europe. The Eurasian region, including the post-Soviet space, has been his enduring research interests. He has looked at transnational corruption and its linkages to development, governance, and sovereignty in the former Soviet states of Central Asia and the Caucasus. Professor Kuli is the author and or editor of several popular and acclaimed books, including Base Politics, a great game, local rules, the new great power context in Central Asia, dictators without borders, power and money in Central Asia, uh, co authored with John Hedershaw, and more recently, Exit from Hegemony, the Unraveling of the American Global Order, co authored with uh, Daniel Nexton. It is a great pleasure to have you here, Professor Kumi, to deliver this talk at the Tibetan Foundation. Uh, let me especially thank Kamakshi Vasan, Chief Operating Officer and Director of Academic Programs, Timothy Foundation, for her leadership, dedication, and sincere efforts. Professor Cooley today will be talking on the theme of global politics and regional order in Central Asia. It's a very relevant idea to discuss since Central Asia has played a major role in defining the direction of global politics and world order across many centuries. It has been the theater of many upheavals and transformations. Today, Central Asia is under the attention of nearly all the major powers of the world. The major geopolitical crisis of the world in the recent years, whether in Afghanistan or the ongoing Ukraine-Russia war, impacts Central Asia very closely. This is due to both the geographical proximity as well as due to historical and political linkages and proximities. Central Asia is a region that is directly contiguous to both the Russian Federation and the People's Republic of China. India is very close to. The question is, how will the region position itself in the evolving world order? What choices will be made? What role will the various external powers play? So we look forward uh, to hearing from you, Professor Kohli, on these questions. And also, as we were discussing earlier, on how your research has been shaped over the decades as we have read your various books. So looking forward to hearing from you, Professor Kohli. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Sam. It's a very kind introduction and it's a real a pleasure and a privilege to be here your foundation has been at the forefront of drawing attention to the region in many different ways i think this is actually my second event so i'm i'm really happy to be back uh yeah this is in some ways it's it's a story of the evolution of central asia's positioning in the global order the relationship between regional orders and global orders and it's also the story of many of my own research interests and how they've unfolded. So let me share my screen. I, I will go through many of the slides quite quickly, but I'm happy to discuss them um, in, uh, in the Q&A because this is a knowledgeable crowd and I want to learn from you. Uh, I do uh, uh, want to point just a, a, a few of the books um, have, have charted this development. And so the most recent one, Exit from Hegemony, we can talk more about the impact of uh, uh, Russia's uh, war in Ukraine on the region um, at large. But certainly there are many trends uh, evolving in Central Asia that, that predate the ripple effects for that. My argument is going to be relatively simple. It's that in the 1990s, Central Asia um, was under uh, some general architectures and principles of the liberal international order, but these were sparse, right? These were sparse. And what we've seen over the last three decades is sort of the, uh, the rise of alternatives, uh, the increasing density of regional orders, especially those affiliated with Russia and China, 
the decline of influence of the United States and other liberal powers. Uh, this is particularly the case in the post-2014 world, and I would argue the recent regional crises that we've seen, Ukraine, Afghanistan, Kazakhstan, have underscored this, right? So it's, it's a talk that makes me really popular when I give uh, in DC, but uh, I think it, it, it accurately reflects some of these evolutions. Just to give you a sense, my initial dissertation research was on the role of Western technical assistance in Central Asia in the transition and transformation in the 1990s. And now the topic seems um, quite past. I wanna draw attention to the argument I make in Great Games Local Rules. And sometimes, uh, I think there's a misperception about the title that I'm alluding to past imperial competition as the dominant driver. Uh, I actually uh, frame the book uh, that it is more about the future politics of a multipolar world. In other words, Central Asia, as I saw 10 years ago, was a harbinger of the challenges to uh, liberal internationalism and also what a multipolar world might look like. Um, the, the key here is that as relations between US, China, and Russia intensified, and not just competitively, we got more and more order, more regional organizations, more in different kinds of norms, different kinds of security relationships, and different kinds of donors, yeah? Um, the second part of the book, The Local Rule, said that the Central Asian governments themselves uh, 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 actively encouraged this interaction right, and tried to enhance their authority and profit from this external interest, right? They tried to wield this external interest and this new kind of multipolar moment um, for their, uh, uh, for the benefit, what we call the 2000s, I called the golden era of multivectorism. But let's just remember the 1990s. Just, I would say, uh, 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 the lack of uh, uh, U.S., certainly North American expertise on the region, saw us predict um, a real competition between Turkey and Iran that didn't materialize. Um, it saw a number of different actors try project themselves, um, whether it's org human rights organizations or uh, uh, countries that were opening uh, religious schools. Uh, and we very much saw Central Asia in a kind of a a post imperial but also a transition type of perspective. And so when I say the liberal order was sparse, it still was there. And it was particularly there in the economic sphere. Um, you know, my kind of favorite factoid of the 1990s is that the largest bilateral donor of official development assistance was actually Japan. And if Japan hoped to get some geopolitical influence out of it, I'm afraid the record isn't very good, but certainly it was the major donor in the area, but also the US, the European Union, um, and also uh, the events that happened, happened in the 1990s were deeply influenced by the advice given by the IMF and by the World Bank in many areas. In particular, uh, the uh, uh, demand to the Kyrgyz Republic in the early 90s that it ditched the ruble unannounced and adopt the national currency in Somme, which uh, plunged the region into an economic crisis that it didn't get out of. Um, for a few years. Um, the other part of this I would uh, just mention here is that the largest foreign investors at the time, the 1990s, uh, were Western companies, and especially here in Kazakhstan's hydrocarbons, um, and especially deals like Tengiz. So 2001, absolutely pivotal. Um, what happens in 9-11 and the war in Afghanistan? It gives rise to a new type of multivectorism and perceptions of a new great game. The original presence of the US and its coalitional partners um, is spread all throughout the region uh, in terms of transit rights, refueling rights, but it's concentrated in Uzbekistan at a post-Soviet base in Karshi Kanabad, and also in Bishkek at Manas Air Base, these two major facilities. Um, Bishkek is a multinational facility for the first a uh, year anyway, then becomes an exclusive American facility, um, but also uh, uh, agreements with all of them. Um, I would say Russia and China uh, were uh, uh, supportive in a lukewarm way. <laughs> so President Putin was actually the first global leader to call President Bush after 9-11 um, and 
offer his support, intelligence sharing, his general staff were reluctant to authorize a US military presence, but by all accounts, he thought this would be a way to partner with Russia to determine uh, future decisions in the periphery of the region. China also reluctant, but China sees the opportunity to tie the global war on terror to its strike hard campaign in Xinjiang. Yeah, and so it uh, successfully uh, uh, pursues the listing of Uyghur affiliated groups um, with the designation of being global terrorist organizations. So for their own reasons, Russia and China at the outset. Now, Russian support for US military base lasts about 18 months until 2003, and then it gets swept up in a number of grievances and tensions um, that characterize the relationship. So um, that's, that's the chronology. Um, US engagement with the region was based upon the security cooperation. Um, and it is a vector, whether it's spaces and logistics, security assistance, reverse transit plans. China starts to economically engage over the 2000s. Chinese trade with the region was just $1 billion total in 2000, not 1990, in 2000. That rises by 50 times over the next decade. And Russia is engaged in the region, but in part strategically, it, uh, I, I sort of term it a weak sphere of influence strategy. In other words, it's concerned with trying to get as much consensus as possible to remain within Russia's orbit, but it leads to real problems, especially Uzbekistan uh, and managing uh, uh, Uzbekistan's more kind of autonomous uh, types of aspirations. But in any case, and this is the argument of great games, external forces with an equilibrium of multivectorism. This is a map from the book. And I like this map for a couple of reasons. A, because it does show all the US led and allied military uh, facilities uh, that we have, whether uh, we see here Karshi Khanabad um, or the Manas Transit Center, but you also see the proximity to Russian military facilities and CSTO facilities. That as the US establishes its presence, Russia now uh, comes back to the region. Some places have never left, like Tajikistan, and it formalizes a basing agreement with the Tajikistan 2004, but it reestablishes a presence at Khan Air Base uh, in Kyrgyzstan, just a few kilometers from Manas. This is in 2003, technically a CSTO facility. So we see um, the proximity um, of military facilities. And so the US always maintained, well, these are just for Afghanistan, these are transit. From the Russian perspective, these were um, outposts of potential influence and engagement in the region. This kind of idea of multi-vectorism uh, is, 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 uh, takes different flavors depending upon the country. So from Kazakhstan, it's happiness in multiple pipelines. In Uzbekistan, you see kind of significant strategic shifts back and forth. Um, and uh, Tajikistan, this open door constraint. I just want to quickly draw attention to Kyrgyzstan. Um, the site of these two bases and the staging post for the US flying in and out in Afghanistan. So the peak geopolitics of the base was in 2009 when President Bakiev initiates what's in essence a US-Russia bidding war over the future of the base. He announces at a joint press conference with President Medvedev then that he will close Manas and at the same press conference, Russia announced a $2 billion Russian aid and investment package and say, oh, these two things aren't linked. Um, what happens in essence is after the initial Russian tranche of aid, uh, Bakiev and his regime, including the active involvement of his son, renegotiate with the US um, and they secure an agreement that raises the rent from $17 million annually to $63 million annually and renames it a transit center as opposed to an air base. Um, Russia, uh, uh, according to more sources, was quite displeased with this, right? They viewed this as a double cross um, by Bakiev. He was ousted the following year. This is a quote from the memoir of Robert Gates, who referred to uh, Bakiev as amazingly corrupt, Manas, a site of grand extortion. And that quote about he, without question, being the most unpleasant foreign deal I had to deal with in my years as secretary. Now, I'm not uh, here commenting on the accuracy of that statement. I'm sure world leaders deal with 
unpleasantries all the time, but this is just to show how transactional the relationship between the US and the Kyrgyz Republic had become, that it was all premised on quid pro quo. It wasn't sort of Kyrgyzstan's fear of what was happening in Afghanistan or engagement or so forth. It was, in essence, a commercial relationship that allowed the US military presence, yeah? The US tried to deny that it was interested primarily in security, even though it was clear that it was, and there was nothing wrong with that. But it had a few goals through 2014. It included reorienting Russian and led old Soviet networks um, away from Moscow, connecting the region with Afghanistan, the so-called new Silk Route, uh, although there wasn't a lot of funding for it, um, as well as maintaining this network of civilities for the US campaign in Afghanistan. Uh, we were told that the US was interested in great gains, not great gains. So I would argue this multi-vector equilibrium breaks down in 2014 for a couple of reasons. Because of two uh, Russian and Chinese initiatives and perceptions of US withdrawal and decline. So let's just go through these quickly. The first Ukraine crisis, 2014, uh, generated shockwaves through Central Asia. The war even more, but this dates back to 2014. And that was because there were two concerns at the time um, after the Maidan protests. On the one hand, yes, there was a concern about possible Russian aggression, presence of US, of rather Russian troops as they were in Sevastopol in Crimea being used um, for a purpose. But there was also concern about the Maidan protests, street protests that bring down a regime. These are like the two existential threats from the perspective of Central Asian regimes. Um, it's not surprising then uh, that at the same time, there's also a rise in anti-Western norms and counter norms, whether they are uh, the kinds of uh, sovereignty and security norms, um, kind of uh, uh, social conservatism rooted in things like Kyrgyz nationalism, Shanghai Cooperation Organization. I know India is a member now, um, but certainly uh, SCO norms uh, were viewed as an implicit critique of universal liberal norms. The point I wanna make though is following the crisis in Crimea, actually Eurasian approval of Russian leadership was quite high. And the way it breaks down, of course, very few favorable opinions in Ukraine, Poland, Kosovo and Germany, but look at the bottom. Look at the approval of Russian leadership following what happened in Crimea in the region, in the Central Asian region, it's quite high. Now, a lot of my colleagues say, well, you can't trust polls and so forth. No, actually, I think in this particular case, it's an accurate reflection. And that's because anytime there's a regional crisis, um, there's a perception that Russia will be a stabilizer, regardless of whether we can argue it's the source of the destabilization. Other reasons for broad uh, approval of Russian leadership in the region, the Russian information space, media network of Sputnik, fear of colored revolutions that were viewed as destabilizing um, um, US supported so-called regime changes. And then of course the Eurasian Economic Union in 2014, which was a real thing. Ukraine didn't want to join it uh, or rather uh, sort of announced sort of an ambivalence to it, but, but, but certainly in Kyrgyzstan, a country that was split on joining uh, the Eurasian Economic Union now overwhelmingly supports it. Why? in part because it puts a framework for legalizing migration, yeah? From sort of Central Asia and the Kyrgyz Republic to Russia. And we can't underestimate the political importance of uh, Central Asian migrants in Russia. Russia views it as an labor necessity, but also geopolitical labor. But certainly when you think about Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, the small states, even though the greatest number of migrants are from Uzbekistan, it's an extremely important vector. Again, Polling from Kyrgyzstan sort of indicates that most Kyrgyz things that uh, Kyrgyzstan was better off as a Soviet Republic or just as well off as a Soviet Republic. Very few believe that it was worse off as a Soviet Republic. Public perceptions of foreign relations, who are your best friends? It's Russia, it's Kazakhstan, it's Turkey, United States, and actually China ranks relatively low. So Crimean ripple effects uh, actually intensifies Russian engagement um, with the region. At the same time, there's a perception of US withdrawal. Um, Obama has announced that 
there will be a withdrawal from Afghanistan. So there's all of a sudden a positioning about what a post-American region is going to look like. I'm sure all of you know about the Belt and Road, so I won't go over it to death, but just to sort of emphasize a historical fact that the Belt and Road around the same time, September 2013, is announced in Kazakhstan at Nazarbayev University. Yeah. And, um, oh, by the way, this is a chart of, of regional trade between China and Russia, just to see China's explosion in the region over the 2000s, right? And really, uh, China surpasses Russia as the main economic player in the region during the great financial crisis of 2000, 2008. So a lot of Chinese investments, Belt and Road-like investments, predate the announcement of the Belt and Road when we think about pipelines, highway construction, and so forth. But just to emphasize, three of the main six corridors pass through Xinjiang and Central Asia. Um, Xinjiang's at the core of BRI infrastructure efforts that connect to Central Asia. And I think a related point that's important, this is from the book Exit from Hegemony. I'll call a, your attention to the lower slide here. Um, the Central Asian states, along with South Asian countries, are joining more Chinese-led regional initiatives than any other countries in any other areas, right? So we cataloged all the Chinese regional initiatives uh, uh, since uh, the end of the Cold War. So the bigger your purple dot, <laughs> the more Chinese-led regional uh, initiatives you have joined. And look how big those dots are um, in the case of Central Asia. Some of them you're well aware of. I think what's really interesting is that Beijing's language of connectivity, saying that it's apolitical, it's based on infrastructure, really mirrored US language. And one of the interesting shifts that you saw during the Trump administration the US did a reversal a 180 degrees from viewing Chinese investment and infrastructure development as a positive, right? Because it functioned as a hedge away from Russia to now being concerned about it, right? And sort of Mike Pompeo going to Central Asia, putting it within the lens that it was predatory uh, uh, and so forth. So I'll just say a couple of things. Um, we have seen consistently that great powers have tried to encourage regional development in Central Asia as part of their own kind of favorable regional development schemes, whether it's the US-backed New Silk Road, whether it is the Belt and Road, whether it's you know, Russian regional integration attempts, the Eurasian Economic Union. And the sort of idea is here that it's the hardware that's the problem, right? That we lack roads, rails, infrastructures. In fact, as I've argued, and I won't get into it, it's, it's also a software problem, right? It's the fact that uh, informal border management, capital flight, kleptocracy, uh, corruption, these are all actually some of the great inhibitors of greater regional integration. I'll just throw up these two slides from, from my work. So we're, between 2016 and 2014, we had all of these different externally imposed regional initiatives. And these are the times of import-export between 2006 and 2014. These are days, not hours. So the only real movement that we've seen is in Uzbekistan. Between 2006 and 2014, we went from 54 days to export something, rather from 80 days to 54, right? 104 days to import something, right? And here's a comparative chart of other regions. Look how cumbersome formal trade is in Central Asia on the left, compared to Eastern Europe, compared to Latin America and the Caribbean, compared to the Middle East and North Africa compared to South Asia. If you were putting down a new Silk Route anywhere in the world, I would say probably Central Asia would not be high on your list to do so, right? Because the informal trade barriers and board controls are quite significant. I'm happy to talk about any of these points more, but I see three governance challenges with the Belt and Road, and there's examples for all of these. Local elites and government agencies in Central Asia and governments and regions privatizing revenue streams from Chinese investment for domestic and patrimonial purposes. A broad collusion to rig tenders and awards for Chinese companies. And the ratcheting of graft and insider contracts, right? China's money dump and bundling raises the cost to other regional investors and demands for side payments. I'll give you just one example because I think it's, it's one of those that sort of captures. Um, in winter of 2018 in Bishpek, uh, the power went off in what was a 
a really cold winter. And the company responsible, uh, a Chinese company, BAA, uh, was responsible for this thermal power plant breakdown. Uh, as it turned out, the company had failed to build a chemical unit to process water for uh, the boilers. And investigations saw that the normal tender for the uh, contract was waived and that there was systematic overbuilding from materials laboring and contracting um, in the company. And so this investigative report generated a lot of anti-Belt and Road sentiment because it sort of crystallized because of corruption and Chinese company neglect, essentially a million residents uh, were freezing, right? And, and so that kind of local effect connected with rape. The point here I'll make is that there's a big difference between elite images of China and public opinion of China in the region. Elite China, uh, images are very deferential to China, talking about strategic partnership, how fortunate we are um, to have Chinese investment. But especially in Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan, you see uh, 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 quite uh, a lot of concern on different kinds of issues. Um, some of the polling on here from Central Asia Barometer, how much confident do you have in China's investment in your country would create jobs for citizens? So if you, even if you just poll on the economic issue, you see a lot of distress in Kazakhstan, in Kyrgyzstan, and Uzbekistan. Um, the blue is a great deal of distress. Uh, uh, the dark blue some, uh, not very much, uh, not at all. But we also see the expansion of the Chinese security footprint. Right, we see the announcement of a military security outpost in the Wakhan corridor, as well as uh, border post uh, uh, cooperation. I can talk more about that. We see the expansion of China's private security actors, um, providing physical dimensions and security. Right, there's over 20 clients of this uh, large private security company in Kyrgyzstan, but also. Um, support services like political risk analysis and risk assessments. Just how much the world has changed, I would argue, can be seen in the UN Human Rights Council uh, support and opposition for uh, the vote that condemned Chinese re-education camps, right? The condemnatory vote, the countries in green, the kind of core members of the liberal international order, and the countries in red uh, uh, supported uh, Beijing, and that number rose significantly. I just want to say a couple more things as I wind down. How enduring is Russian co uh, Chinese cooperation in Central Asia? It's been described as an axis of convenience or even a division of labor. I think neither of those two actually is true. It's, 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 it's a far deeper partnership than just an axis of convenience. And the division of labor doesn't make sense anymore because Russia does economics um, and China does security. They both do both. It's just that they overlap. I do think that assum this assumption in the West that we had that Moscow would kind of wake up and see what China was doing in Central Asia and this would generate friction. Uh, instead, what we see is that Russia's growing anxiety and insecurity pushes it towards China and Chinese positions, softening its own red lines. We can talk about some of those red lines, but China has broached them all and Russia hasn't responded, right? I think this revisionist stance towards the US-led international order is the common glue now. And you've seen a change in Russian rhetoric. There's a turn towards a greater Eurasia, right? From a Russian sphere of influence to a greater Eurasia. And for Russia, then greater Eurasia represents a common space between Europe, Russia, and Asia, where Russia can play the role of center for integration that accommodates Chinese investment and Russian influence. As long as it's non-Western, it's okay for Putin, right? Um, so accepting Chinese asymmetric economic power as if it's in Russia's interests has been one of the really key developments, I would say, of the last few years. Finally, let's just then talk about the external shocks then that the region has faced. So we've talked about 2014, certainly the 2020 COVID shock saw both China and Russia engage in vaccine diplomacy. But let's not forget before the war in Ukraine, we had the chaotic withdrawal from the US, um, and rather from Afghanistan, right? Uh, the Taliban uh, coming into power. We had in January, 2022, uh, demonstrations in Kazakhstan and the CSTO intervention at his request to restore order, and then invasion of Ukraine. 
So Central Asia has had to adjust to a post-US Afghanistan. The Central Asian governments have adopted a pragmatism with Taliban. Uh, Tajikistan uh, was the reluctant one here. But in significantly, they've all backed Russian and Chinese regional security and economic initiatives, right? They've adopted Russian and CSTO member positions to not accept Af Afghan re refugees, and more importantly, denied US basing access for the withdrawal. So think about this. We go from the US military presence in the early 2000s being everywhere in the region to now the countries denying for withdrawal US basing access from where they wanted to fly some surveillance drones. This was reported pretty extensively by the Wall Street Journal. The Kazakhstan story is an interesting one because we were told before that the CSTO was just a paper organization, that it didn't do anything. And in fact, it did refuse some requests for interventions from Kyrgyzstan in 2010, from Armenia in 2020. But Takayev's request was a chance to bolster the regime um, without uh, taking sides in a regional dispute and conflict. And so Putin and Lukashenko approved this overnight. And uh, the concern, uh, was expressed, well, once Russian troops come, this is what Secretary Blinken said, they usually don't depart. They actually did depart after two weeks. How did China react to the CSTO? Um, it took a while for them to come out with a statement, but then they came out with the statement. I think the relevant parts are in red. Firmly oppose external force and foment color revolutions. Firmly support Kazakhstan in its effort to maintain stability and stop violence. And reiterate the strong leadership of President uh, Takaya. So not an explicit endorsement of the intervention, but certainly an explicit endorsement of Tokayev's request for the intervention. And this is what I mean. I think rather than become flashpoints for Russian-Chinese tension, they become opportunities for mutual accommodation, right? Just a final thing on the war in Ukraine. Um, certainly, you're probably all familiar with which countries are, are neutral, which countries have supported Russia, all of the Central Asian countries, I would say, have expressed official neutrality. Um, some uh, voted uh, in, or either abstained, uh, and some countries didn't vote at all, right? They didn't want to partake in this. But the war has been very difficult on the Central Asian countries. None of them have joined the sanctions. They oppose the sanctions. Um, they have faced real concerns about food disruption, grain, sugar, um, compliance risk and secondary sanctions. We're seeing an interesting phenomenon of double migration to and from Russia. So not only is migration to Russia peaking up again, but also now we have Russian exiles and those who uh, avoided mobilization that came in two waves, now in the capitals of uh, Central Asia, in Bishkek, in Tashkent, even in Dushanbe, we see tens of thousands of say IT workers uh, Russian IT workers. This is having a transformative effect on these countries' economies, right? Um, so certainly uh, the war is having these unintended consequences. If you go on the website of the Eurasian Economic Union, you'll see that nothing has changed. There's no reference to the war. There's no reference to the disruptions. So it seems to be an attempt to sort of navigate business as usual. Also, the Central Asian states don't share the opprobrium towards Russia that we have in the West. So this is a vote actually to remove or suspend Russia from the UN Human Rights Council for its war crimes in Ukraine. All the Central Asian states, uh, uh, with the exception of Turkmenistan, vote no. Not abstain, Turkmenistan didn't vote, they vote no, right? And I think that's significant too, um, that show normative support for Russia. In Kazakhstan, I think popular opinion is relatively split. I think it's about half-half. Kyrgyzstan, it's more supportive of Russia. So this is my final slide. Um, the era of obvious multivectorism is over um, because of perceptions and now the actuality of US disengagement. Yes, the Central Asian states want multivectorism, but they're not getting it from the West. So where do they turn to, to hedge against Russia and China that will be permanent features of the geopolitical landscape. They're trying to turn to countries like Turkey, India, of course, the Gulf states, but the West is not the vector anymore. Um, we see the Central Asian states have tried to navigate regional crisis, uh, manage this external environment, 
but this post-Western geopolitics remains fluid, subject to change. My own prediction is the China-Russia rivalry will continue to be downplayed by both actors, even as uh, uh, Chinese power becomes more and more asymmetrical. And actually, I think the war uh, uh, will also intensify uh, its power in the region. So I've gone on long enough. Uh, let's engage in a discussion. And I'm very happy to hear your, uh, your thoughts and comments. Take your questions. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Tui, for that very interesting speech where you covered a wide spectrum of Eurasian region, of Central Asia, of the way the region has evolved from the 1990s to the 2000s, 2014, and post 2014. And of course, uh, the Ukraine crisis is on way. Of course, other challenges like COVID that the region faced. Uh, we will start with. Uh, the interactive discussion, and of course, we'll have questions from the members of the audience as well. Uh, but let me just uh, come to you with the question as we were we planned earlier. That you know, you know, just start with like you know, when you were writing in in, in, the, in the in the first decade of this uh, century, and you were talking about this uh, corruption of the base, uh, the various bases that were managed in Uzbekistan, the K2 base, the Manas Air Base in Kyrgyzstan, and you talk about you know structural corruption. You also talked about international sort of transnational financial networks. But today in 2023, what do you think of that? Because we hear of democratizing processes in Central Asia. In many countries where things are apparently getting better, we see their rankings of some countries uh, in this uh, various indexes getting better. Some might not be, some might be different. So how do you see the situation evolve? Yeah. Yes, thank you very much for that question. So yeah, I think actually, um, a lot of the related schemes regard, regarding the bases got me attuned to the transnational nature of corruption in the network. So this is uh, uh, the one in Kyrgyzstan, for instance, on the fuel contracts. And every day in Kyrgyzstan, the U.S. would use uh, what amounted to three Olympic-sized swimming pools worth of jet fuel. Kyrgyzstan is a landlocked country. It's a lot of fuel to breathe. So and this is sort of a, a, a kind of really I, what I would say a revealing anecdote. Um, the fuel itself, as it turned out, was being smuggled in from the Omsk refinery in Siberia. And it was being certified as for civilian use. There were layers of shell companies involved to obscure this. And the whole scheme was uh, set up by uh, a dodgy company registered in Gibraltar. Now, what I think is significant about this is at the time in which you have this geopolitical back and forth, this base bidding war, you see this collusion between Russia, uh, Russian sourcers <laughs> and US procurement officers to procure fuel for the Manas base, right? So it creates some really interesting contradictions and tensions. I would say in terms of democratization now, I think there's, uh, it, impl it implicates itself in interesting ways. And I'll just briefly talk about Kazakhstan. Takayev is adamant to try and denazarbayev, if that's a verb, <laughs> and engage in the denazarbayevification of Kazakhstan as a country, right? Um, and, and, and it's clear he's uh, taking family members out of plum posts. He's uh, uh, also cleaning up the sovereign wealth fund, making a number of reforms. And also there's been some tries for in, in embezzlement members of the family, though not the immediate clue. The problem that Takaya faces is that most of the assets that have been taken by the family are offshore, right? And they're hidden. And it's not clear what the extent of these holdings are. So it's actually very difficult to conclude a pacted agreement for transition when you don't exactly know what's involved in the pact, right? And so this is part of the problem Takaya faced. He charged his team gave them two months to go and identify all the Nazarbayev family's assets overseas. Well, this is the work of, of two decades, right? And it's unlikely to happen. So I think what you'll see is the continuing tension between exposés and stories of some of these foundations and holdings uh, and what's happening now. And I think um, there will be a, a continuing issue there of sort of uh, uh, how is it that you can return some of these assets to Kazakhstan itself? And there'll be sort of political demands for that. 
I can talk about asset recovery and on the other cases too, but I do think that the offshore nature of the Nazarbayev family holdings greatly complicates efforts to democratize um, in Kazakhstan. Right, right. That was a very uh, interesting response, but just uh, sticking to this, I, I mean, when we look at that, you know, you talked about Manas uh, Airbase, that thing that happened, and in your writings, you were also talking about how the regime could do this kind of uh, hedging, strategic hedging between uh, Russia on one side and the US on the other side, and you also write that it could cost it to them in the end. So, like, what kind of leverage, and I'm not talking just in terms of this kind of uh, these kind of deals and all, but what kind of political leverage do Central Asian regimes today have? You know, the to me, the story of base politics, U.S. based politics in Central Asia, is a story about the fundamental contradictions of the liberal order. On the one hand, the U.S., you know, the, the main purpose here was to support operations in Afghanistan. At the same time, they talked about being dedicated to democratizing the region, pursuing anti-corruption, um, empowering civil society and oversight. And what happened, you saw a spotlight in their two base hubs in Uzbekistan after the Andijan crackdown by President Karima. The U.S. was put in a position where some parts condemned Uzbekistan, others stayed silent. China and Russia strongly supported Karimov's actions. Um, and eventually, a few months later, um, the U Uzbekistan expelled the U.S. because of State Department criticism about Andijan. And in Kyrgyzstan, you saw the contradictions over uh, corruption. I think what the Central Asian states uh, started to see was that they could connect all of these things, right? Rather than deal with them on separate tracks, they could say, well, if you want base access, um, you know, stop giving us a hard time. Or um, you promised us quid pro quo, we want quid pro quo. We don't just want U.S. Peace Corps volunteers and this aid that you're counting in the package, which was a real negotiation from the Kyrgyz. So I do think there's an interesting reverse dynamic now. Now that the U.S. military is essentially gone, um, I would argue uh, the Central Asian states maybe don't have as much leverage anymore. And so I actually think it's an interesting opportunity for the U.S. to be involved in a more niche way, right? I'm thinking about uh, other areas of cooperation that aren't necessarily sort of bundling all of these sort of strategic concerns together. Um, but I do think there was significant learning by the Central Asian states that they could connect areas that the U.S. didn't want to connect. Right, 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 absolutely. Uh, so there's some questions about free trade agreements. So I, I think in the terms of you talked about regional integration and the efforts of Central Asian states to integrate and the challenges therein. So how do you see free trade agreements within this framework? Yeah, it's a great question. Thank you for that. So what we've seen is some countries, um, I, I kind of, I, let's start with sort of a twofold dynamic. Um, countries that began the road to WTO membership in the 1990s, right? And then countries that followed Russian regional initiatives, right? So Kyrgyzstan initially very open to the WTO, first country to sign, uh, uh, Kazakhstan sort of follows. Um, and in, in essence, uh, uh, in the 2000s, Russia is also wanting to geoeconomically counter. So they start a customs union, right, amongst the Central Asian countries. Um, and then that uh, evolves into Eurasian economic union. The problem is <laughs> that you have these two different sorts of legal frameworks. So what Kyrgyzstan ends up doing in the 2000s, it's very lucrative. They end up becoming a re-export hub for China into the region. They accept Russian, uh, uh, rather Chinese exports, right? And then they re-export these Chinese goods throughout the Russian-led customs union to other places, right? Kyrgyzstan becomes an entrepot. It leverages these two different sort of legal arrangements. Um, it eventually has to shut down um, the WTO formal re-export, but it's going on informally now um, anyway. Uh, the big issue here is that Uzbekistan has always been autarkic. So it has refused to sign on to free trade agreements. Now there's progress in that area with Mirziyoyev. But Karimov was very reluctant um, to engage in regional integration, very distressful. He saw political problems as a result. And I think to me, this is the real important thing. We'll get true regional integration 
especially when the two biggest and most important countries, Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, engage in organic economic cooperation. That's the key. It can't be imposed, not by IFIs, not by Russia, not by China, not by the United States. It needs to come from the region. And unfortunately, I think, you know, you see one of the, the kind of uh, uh, the ripple effects of COVID, of the war, um, is uh, uh, really, you know, putting on hold attempts, right, to sort of increase um, the connectivity in the region. But I do think that's where the future is. And I think uh, we'll, we'll see some developments in that area. Right, right, absolutely. So talking about uh, the, the competition between China and Russia, as you see in Central Asia, or you, I mean, which is to some extent latent now, but uh, you, 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 you predict that it might come to the forefront later or there is a chance of happening that happening. How do you see this, uh, particularly, I mean, uh, in, 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 I'm talking about in, in, in the medium term, say like 10 years, 20 years, how do you see that as China uh, takes uh, a much greater uh, bolster position? Yeah, thank you. So I do think, um, I, I, th I th think just to back up a little bit from, uh, from, from the Chinese perspective, why Central Asia important? Right, it is important because it's a transit route that connects these many regions on the, the hub of the Belt and Road. But it's also important because a good number of Central Asian countries, Afghanistan included, um, border Xinjiang. From the Chinese perspective, there's this, this equation that greater economic development breeds political stability, yeah? And so greater infrastructure investments, just that, as they did in Xinjiang, will bring economic development opportunity, should also promote political stability. I wonder sometimes. It might do in certain cases, but in other cases, greater economic development might fuel ethnic divides, right? It might fuel um, um, perceptions of corruption or per predatory behavior. In other words, I don't think it's, it's, it's a one-on-one -on -one relationship. And so the fundamental challenge China is going to have is uh, uh, how to deal with a region that it wants to fall in line on sort of Chinese regional um, objectives um, while maintaining a delicate enough touch so that it doesn't encourage this backlash that we're seeing at the popular level against China. Um, and so one of the things I've noticed in my own research is the, the, the corruption scandals that get covered in Central Asia are Chinese corruption scandals. Why? Now that we don't have US bases anymore. Why? Because it's too politically dangerous to cover Russian corruption scandals, right? So Chinese corruption scandals, um, they're okay. So there, there is this perception that somehow uh, 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 China is uh, uh, paying off uh, local leaders' populations. The other real issue, I would say, is relations with Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, and Kyrgyzstan, the potential of debt, debt trap dynamics. What we've seen in Tajikistan, um, uh, it, con territorial concessions in 2011 that Tajikistan had sort of gave away <laughs> part of the Pamiri Mountains to China in a border negotiation. And as debt to China mounts, and, 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 and China is now the largest creditor in the region, what will China demand of these countries, right? Territorial concessions, concessions in mines, um, you know, a greater share of pipeline revenues, it's unclear. And so how China chooses to leverage this economic dependency is an open question. So essentially Kyrgyzstan, um, Tajikistan too, they've exchanged um, IFIs and foreign creditors for uh, uh, Chinese assistance. And it's unclear what uh, China will demand in, in return. Thank you so much. Uh, in, in, you're talking about development assistance and you've talked about uh, Japan, you talked about South Korea, of course they have provided. So in, in, if you could talk a bit about uh, how this uh, development aid that Central Asian states have received, uh, also from European Union, from Russia, China, United States, and contextualizing it in, in, in the present circumstances is how do we go forward with this? So I think certainly, because I also see a, a really good question in, in the chat, sir, does the West provide, propose any alternative to BRI in the region? Um, there was 
uh, an announcement by the Biden administration, this build back better world, right, as an alternative right. to China's uh, engagement. And certainly uh, Japanese assistance is a big part of that. And certainly Korea uh, has been involved too. The, the problem is that um, perception of the West is that it has a lot of sort of grand schemes, but it doesn't actually pony up the actual financing, right? And this is the issue that you, the US um, bureaucracy doesn't work that way. Um, security assistance is one thing, but the US can't direct the World Bank or the IMF to just increase their lending. It can nudge, it can influence, but not at the scale that's being requested. That's one problem. The second problem is, um, I think donors have been burned in the region, right? I mean, I think, you know, the, 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 the perception the Japanese have is, you know, they, they value their partnership and they do want the Central Asian states to see them as a hedge. But again, in terms of the geopolitical payoff that they've gotten, it's not at all clear. It's been uh, commensurate to the resources that they put up. Korea is an interesting case. We project Korea as a potential Western type influence, but really Korean aid is about aiding Korean diaspora in their investments and economic networks. I think very important, um, but less geopolitical and more about um, Korea's own economic interest in the region as it's funneled through Korean speaking uh, communities, especially in Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan. So all this is to say the Western response, it's a patchwork. It's a patchwork of slogans, of initiatives, of different countries, it doesn't carry the same economic weight as Chinese investment does in the region. And that's the fundamental problem. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, I'm talking about you know uh, the revisionist powers. I mean, uh, what do you see? I mean, because we started out this discussion as to what role Central Asia will play. So, do you think uh, the theater of Central Asia will? How will this aid in this revisionist project of uh, China and Russia? Um, and here, perhaps I differ with some of my colleagues. Um, I think it already has. I think it already has, right? I think, to me, Central Asia is a region where you see what the dynamics of a post-Western world look like. And, of course, um, you know, we continue to have deep concerns about what the Taliban is doing in Afghanistan. But you see, essentially, this is post-Western governance. It's... Uh, a, a patchwork of different um, uh, uh, architecture schemes, some formal, some informal. It's China taking the lead to provide humanitarian assistance um, to Afghanistan. It's inserting its own uh, uh, types of interests and demands on the Taliban government. Um, and so it's also China positioning itself as saying, well, it's the US that's blocking your central bank assets and freezing them. They're the ones who are inflicting this economic pain and suffering. And so it's also using Russian and Chinese revisionist discontent against US sanctions as a way of talking about um, uh, 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 you know, the, the, the importance of kind of non-Western you know, payment systems and arrangements and, and so forth throughout the region. So I actually think that you see these trends in Central Asia more than you do everywhere. It doesn't mean that the West is completely absent. Of course, there are many kinds of global economic links. I've argued with John Heatherstaw that we tend to see Central Asia as isolated, but financially, they're very much integrated uh, into um, the fighting global financial system and through shell companies and, and, and bank accounts and so forth. So, so, you know, I think the revisionism is there and I think it's clear that all of the Central Asian states will try and remain as accommodating to Russia they can. They don't, uh, of course, they're concerned with what's happening in, 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 in Kiev, um, but uh, being geopolitically landlocked and being dependent on Russia and China carries real existential concerns. And so they have to be mindful of those. Right, it's not an option for them. It's it's a structural condition. Right, great. Right. Before coming to energy questions, I just want another important political question: is that many uh, Western analysts also talk about you know a potential regime collapse or such things. Articles are seen about in Russia. How do you look at that? I mean, uh, about the, the regime stability in Russia. Regime stability in Russia. Yeah. Uh, 
I think it's one of those very difficult things because even if the regime were, uh, if uh, Putin were to be displaced through some sort of coup or something, you would never get word of it beforehand, right? So we don't know, there's speculation. I, I think that you do see some interesting factionalism that I can't imagine is healthy for regime stability over the long term. And that's a factionalism amongst the Wagner group, the group of mercenaries that are leading the Bakhmut offensive and uh, the Ministry of Defense. And the two are criticizing each other almost as much as they're criticizing the West, right? You're seeing um, a real draw on manpower. You're seeing deep concern about this um, in the Russian public. Yes, support for the war, um, but anxiety uh, uh, in Russian public opinion in a way that wasn't the case um, uh, a week ago, or uh, rather a year ago. So I do think uh, uh, the sanctions, I think we both kind of overestimated them, but maybe we're underestimating that. We overestimated the power of financial sanctions, right? We thought this would bring the Russian ruble to the verge of collapse, bring the Russian economy to its knees. It didn't work that way. They were ready for it. Central bank interventions, capital controls, and so forth. It was a very effective dealing with financial sanctions. But the other sanctions will have a long-term toll. Yes, there'll be workarounds, but essentially, you know, you're talking about taking three, four, five points of GDP every year. Is that existential? No. Is it going to stop the war? No, but it's seriously going to retard Russia's economic growth over the next 20, 25 years. So do you think Russia's military abilities, given that it is being affected due to this war, how far is it impacted? It's, I mean, do you think it is overreached? It's, it's just too outspread that, you know, will it be able to finance its activities in Central Asia? Yeah, I, I think it has uh, over over expanded. And in fact, you see this with the moving of Russian troops from places where they were, places like South Ossetia, places like Tajikistan, places like Syria, coming back to throw manpower at this. Um, I do think we have to differentiate the success of Russia's military campaign, which has been a, um, uh, a, a real issue. And I think the war itself has been a strategic failure from what they perceive to be as support right? So, you know, India's neutrality, declaration of neutrality or support in the global south. They take a supporting of Russia. Now you say, okay, glass half full, glass half empty. But I do think the Russians are right that concerns about global ordering play into support or opposition on the war, right? So when we see ICC indictment <laughs> for Vladimir Putin, African countries are going to be extremely cynical and skeptical about that, right? So these are concerns with the liberal world order that get grafted onto the war. My line on this, you know, maybe, maybe I'll be proven wrong. I think there's an irony here. I think Russia is correct to sort of say publicly that we are shifting increasingly to a post-Western world, right? Another theme of Xi and Putin today. Um, however, I think Russia's role in the post-Western world will be quite diminished. That I think they're gonna be uh, uh, really completely asymmetrically dependent on China and that their leverage within the post-Soviet sphere um, is going to be degraded along with their military capabilities. Whether there's a complete Ukrainian victory or not, clearly this has been damaging to Russia's prestige and just track weapons orders from Russia, right? As an end indication of how the perception is that how has Russian military equipment performed? How reliable are they as a military uh, supplier? So yeah. Right, right. So uh, on the question of energy, so these kind of natural gas and energy distribution networks in, uh, in Central Asia, and uh, so what kind of uh, strategy does the West have in this regard? Yeah, the West doesn't have a lot of levers. There's two different areas here, oil and gas. And let's take them in different uh, settings. So in oil, we saw US Western companies were the ones that invested major investments in Tengiz in Kazakhstan. Um, you know, the deal of the century. And what we've seen, all sorts of problems with Tengiz, it is pumping now, um, but we're seeing Western companies gradually withdraw from that consortium. And actually who's picking up their stakes? It's CNPC in China. China is increasingly uh, mopping up some of the smaller and medium fields that are unprofitable from the Western perspective to invest in. They're connecting them all into that trans-Kazakh pipeline. I have a slide of that, I should have brought it. Um, so that's on the one hand. Gas, um, we've seen a sort of a 180 here where the Central Asian gas used to be piped into the Russian network, right? That would then export into Europe. 
And since 2009, we've seen that reversed and we've seen China build the China Central Asia gas network, which takes Turkmen gas through Uzbekistan, through Kazakhstan into China. That has line A, B, C. Now there is a line D that will also access gas from a Tajik field and traverse Kyrgyzstan. So once that build, all five Central Asian countries will be on the Chinese gas grid, right? And so this is enormously significant in terms of sort of political leverage because this isn't a consortium. Um, the pipeline is governed through a series of bilateral agreements. So say there's a dispute between Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan over what's flowing in the pipeline, which is the what country mediates this. It's going to be China, right? So 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 gas, you're seeing the buildup of the Russian network of the rather the Chinese network. Um, there is some talk now of Russia selling some gas to Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan um, in part to substitute for Europe. Um, but really no one can compete with those kinds of very lucrative long-term gas contracts that Gazprom had with Europe. Great, great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, finally, I would like to talk to you a bit about public diplomacy that the Central Asian countries, particularly Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, they're undertaking, you know, they have this major conferences on connecting Central Asia and South Asia together and all of these. Uh, so, I mean, in these terms, when Central Asia itself reaches out, for example, the Turkey Council meeting where Hungary itself, these countries attend. So how do you look at these Central Asian countries themselves taking initiatives, connecting with the world? What, does, what impact does it have on the region of the world? I think it's very, I think it's a very positive step, right? I think connectivity has to come from the countries that want to be connected. It can't be externally imposed. To me, that's one of the lessons of the last two decades. Um, I think, you know, it, you know, the political will is the first step, right? Then you see how tough the neighborhood is, right? So for example, can we have real connectivity with a Taliban regime in Afghanistan, right? Can we have actual networks that traverse um, Afghanistan? You know, I'm, I'm skeptical still, you know, maybe eventually. Can we have connectivity with Western sanctions, right? We've seen disruptions in the Trans-Eurasian uh, 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 rail routes, right, that used to sort of supply Chinese goods and also, you know, across Russia. So, so, so the geopolitical instability really gets in the way of connectivity, but at least the political will is there, right? And I think that's very significant. The other thing I think you'll see in Central, you're already seeing it, is uh, uh, an increasing shift to some other areas, especially the Persian Gulf, Right, and Gulf countries are increasingly becoming hubs uh, for re-export, for investment. Um, and so the UAE relationship is important now for all the Central Asian states. Um, and so, you know, you're you're seeing this sort of shift eastward, I would say, in general, in orientation. Um, but the, the, the physical connectivity has geographic and geopolitical limits. Um, and I think that's that's the difficult the difficult challenge in a time of in a time of war, frankly. Great, great, great. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, what what do you think is is the impact that you know kind of this uh, this collapse of multilateralism, you know, obvious multilateralism as you talk about it, and has uh, options open for you know this Turkey, India you mentioned in your uh, in your presentation. So what role you know for 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 this multipolar multi-aligned role that they have? Uh, what, what futuristic vision do you have? Yeah, I think there's a lot of opportunity and you see that. Um, I, think, I think it's probably fair to say that uh, Indian geopolitical ambitions probably were not matched in the 2000s um, with the actual outcomes in part because um, the landlocked nature of these places made them difficult and in part because uh, it was difficult to compete against Chinese investments in certain areas. Um, natural resource, especially given the nature of how China co-ops elites in the region. Um, but I do think organic cooperation, there is a real opportunity here. And you see it in the case of Turkey. Um, Turkey had all these geopolitical ambitions in the 1990s, very few of them were realized. Um, but now you see Turkish companies really at the forefront of the construction sector across Central Asia um, and, and you know, building commercial real estate um, and so forth. So uh, I do think all of the Central Asian states still want multi-vectorism. And let me clarify, 
It's not that they don't want multivector. That is their foreign policy orientation. It's just that the West is not that third pillar anymore. So they have to make up. They have to find sources of that, that third pillar. Maybe it will be a bit with the US education cooperation, right, in some areas. Um, but for the most part, um, or you know, some EU interest, but it has to come from other third parties, India, Turkey, South Korea, the UAE. And so I think it's actually a priority for them to increase as much non-Chinese and non-Russian cooperation as they can. It's just not being provided by the West anymore. Um, now, can that is that sufficient, right, to be like a real pillar of multivectorism? You know, I don't know. That's that, that, that's a difficult assessment to make. Um, but um, certainly, they all want options if they can. Definitely, definitely, they're looking for options. Uh, now, talking about your questions, the speculative thing. So, if you are suggesting that you know China, Russia would find itself to be a junior partner of China. So in that respect, and also you talked about India being part of SEO. Now, largely India's association with SEO is true because of Russian encouragement or because of its friendship with Russia. Now, if Russia fails to be an autonomous actor, and given uh, India's acute border tensions where troops are uh, stationed quite uh, near each other in the eastern sector of India's borders, what do you think would, I mean, India would obviously be not, the engagement with Central Asian region would be different. So. How do you look at this, uh, you know, the changing uh, geopolitics of such Yeah, thank you for that great question. Very informed question about the SCO. SCO is an organization I followed a lot since its inception. And, you know, let's not forget, we talked about 9-11. 9 uh, was a driver, not only for the U.S. presence, but for the counter presence. And so the SCO, yes, was announced in June. It was established in June 2001, just two months, three months before 9-11, yeah? But post 9-11, we saw a frenetic drive by China, right, to sort of uh, substantiate the SEO in 2001 and 2002, the adoption of its norms, of the counter uh, terrorism center. Um, so there was an attempt to really put bones on the flesh on the SEO in response to the US presence, yeah? And so China then tried during the financial crisis to use the SEO as an economic vehicle for financial support. Russia refused. This is the part that you don't see sort of publicly. They wanted, they were concerned about sort of Chinese economic uh, influence, but they were also uh, wanted to push their own Eurasian Development Bank. And China has tried time and time and again to do things like free trade, investment through the SEO. It's failed every time. <laughs> You're right, expansion was a trade-off, right? Russia pushing India, uh, China pushing Pakistan, the two coming in together. In part, China has given up on the SEO as this economic vehicle, and that's why they allowed the expansion. So China now does a lot of the multilateral influence and lending through other organs, um, the uh, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank or the New Development Bank, right, the BRICS Bank, and it does bilateral BRI things. It doesn't need the SEO on the economic front. So it's okay with the SEO being a symbolically uh, symbolic organization, but it's it's very important symbolically to China. And never forget, even though you're now members, this was China's first regional organization, right? It's so it was very kind of prickly about criticism. It always wanted to put its best face forward, um, but in terms of substance, it's now doing what it originally it hoped it could do through the SEO, through other uh, channels and vehicles. But it, I think the SEOs do help uh, for countries like India to reach to uh, the, the South, the Central Asian countries, apart from Turkmenistan, all the four countries. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's actually a good space to be able to talk about issues, um, especially issues uh, regarding uh, uh, Russia and China in a multilateral forum, right? And it gives them, it gives right. them that safety to do so. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Right, right, right. Thank you so much uh, for that uh, for discussion. I mean, we had a lovely discussion on many of the aspects on, on the uh, Eurasian region, on Central Asia, on geopolitics, and on the, uh, the future of the world order and the various challenges thereof. Thank you so much, Professor Puri, for delivering this address. Thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you for your great questions and comments. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you.